Chapter Twenty Three of From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Twenty Three The Projectile Vehicle. On the completion of the Columbiad, the public interest centered in the projectile itself. The vehicle which was destined to carry the three hardy adventurers into space. The new plans had been sent to Breadwell and Company of Albany with the request for their speedy execution. The projectile was consequently cast on the second of November and immediately forwarded by the Eastern Railway to Stones Hill, which it reached without accident on the tenth of that month, where Michael Arden, Barbicane, and Nicole were waiting impatiently for it. The projectile had now to be filled to the depth of three feet with a bed of water, intended to support a watertight wooden disc, which worked easily within the walls of the projectile. It was upon this kind of raft that the travellers were to take their place. This body of water was divided by horizontal partitions, which the shock of the departure would have to break in succession. Then, each sheet of the water, from the lowest to the highest, running off into escape tubes toward the top of the projectile, constituted a kind of spring, and the wooden disc, supplied with extremely powerful plugs, would not strike the lowest plate except after breaking successively the different partitions. Undoubtedly, the travellers would still have to encounter a violent recoil after the complete escapement of the water. But the first shock would be almost entirely destroyed by this powerful spring. The upper parts of the walls were lined with a thick padding of leather, fastened upon springs of the best steel, behind which the escape tubes were completely concealed. Thus, all imaginable precautions had been taken for averting the first shock. And if they did get crushed, they must, as Michael Arden said, be made of very bad materials. The entrance into this metallic tower was by a narrow aperture contrived in the wall of the cone. This was hermetically closed by a plate of aluminum, fastened internally by powerful screw pressure. The travellers could therefore quit their prison at pleasure as soon as they should reach the moon. Light and view were given by means of four thick lenticular glass scuttles, two pierced in the circular wall itself the third in the bottom, the fourth in the top. These scuttles then were protected against the shock of departure by plates let into solid grooves, which could easily be opened outward by unscrewing them from the inside. Reservoirs firmly fixed contain water and the necessary provisions, and fire and light were procurable by means of a gas, contained in a special reservoir under a pressure of several atmospheres. They had only to turn a tap, and for six hours the gas would light and warm this comfortable vehicle. There now remained only the question of air, for allowing for the consumption of air by Barbicane, his two companions, and two dogs which he proposed taking with him. It was necessary to renew the air of the projectile. Now air consists principally of twenty-one parts oxygen and seventy-nine of nitrogen. The lungs absorb the oxygen, which is indispensable for the support of life, and reject the nitrogen. The air expired loses nearly five per cent of the former, and contains nearly an equal volume of carbonic acid produced by the combustion of the elements of the blood. In an airtight enclosure, then, after a certain time all the oxygen of the air will be replaced by the carbonic acid, a gas fatal to life. There were two things to be done then. First, to replace the absorbed oxygen. Secondly, to destroy the expired carbonic acid. Both easy enough to do, by means of chlorate of potassium and caustic potash. The former is a salt which appears under the form of white crystals. When raised to a temperature of 400 degrees, it is transformed into chlorure of potassium and the oxygen which it contains is entirely liberated. 
Now twenty-eight pounds of chlorate of potassium produces seven pounds of oxygen, or two thousand four hundred litres, the quantity necessary for the travellers during twenty-four hours. Caustic potash has a great affinity for carbonic acid, and it is sufficient to shake it in order for it to seize upon the acid and form bicarbonate of potassium. By these two means they would be enabled to restore to the vitiated air its life-supporting properties. It is necessary, however, to add that the experiments had hitherto been made in anima villi. Whatever its scientific accuracy was, they were at present ignorant how it would answer with human beings. The honour of putting it to the proof was energetically claimed by J. T. Maston. Since I am not to go, said the brave arterialist, I may at least live for a week in the projectile. It would have been hard to refuse him, so they consented to his wish. A sufficient quantity of chlorate of potassium and of caustic potash was placed at his disposal, together with provisions, for eight days, and having shaken hands with his friends on the 12th of November at six o'clock a.m., after strictly informing them not to open his prison before the 20th at six o'clock p.m., he slid down the projectile, the plate of which at once hermetically sealed. What did he do with himself during that week? They could get no information. The thickness of the walls of the projectile prevented any sound reaching from the inside to the outside. On the 20th of November, at 6 p.m. exactly, the plate was opened. The friends of J.T. Maston had been all along in a state of much anxiety, but they were promptly reassured on hearing a jolly voice shouting a boisterous hurrah. Presently afterward, the secretary of the gun club appeared at the top of the cone in a triumphant attitude. He had grown fat. End of chapter 23